A lot of Amazon e-commerce sellers are just getting to the point in the life cycle of their businesses where they're either ready to sell their brand, their business, or they're thinking about selling. And businesses like Perch are there to buy them. This discussion is with Chris Bell, the CEO and founder of Perch. Perch acquires and builds up Amazon e-commerce businesses. Perch and Chris have had a lot of success in the space recently. And that's why I'm so excited to sit down with Chris to talk about his story, the story behind Perch, and some specific strategies with Amazon acquisition, both from the perspective of buying and selling Amazon e-commerce businesses. My goal with this episode was really to get an insider's look, a behind the scenes perspective on someone who's in the acquisition space, someone who is there buying Amazon brands, someone who can give some solid advice to the people who are watching, and also just to talk about the current status of the industry itself and what's coming in the near future. Chris is the second interview that I've done with some exciting e-commerce brands and there are more on the way. So if you wanna keep up to date with what we're doing with all the content that we're putting out, make sure you subscribe. There are also a couple other content pieces that are coming up in the take metrics ecosystem that are really exciting as well. There's a Walmart webinar coming up where we'll be talking with Walmart about the future of Walmart, the future of e-commerce. You wanna make sure that you're present for that. That's gonna be a really good live interaction with Walmart's e-commerce team. All that being said, let's jump into this interview with Chris to talk about his story, the story behind Perch, and all things Amazon acquisition. Hey everyone, and welcome to the first in-person interview for both of us in probably over a year. Is yeah, that is maybe that almost right? two years? Maybe yeah. maybe two years, which is odd to say, but it's good to be here with you, Chris. And today we're talking about uh, we're talking about Perch, and we were talking about a little bit of the history behind Perch before sitting down. Honestly, I can't think of a better way to start than to talk about who you are and your background, just even leading into Perch. So, Chris, who are you? <laughs> who are you? Who are you? How did you get into this space? How did you get into e-commerce? Yeah, definitely. Well, let me start. I'll go kind of all the way back to the beginning of my career. Um, computer engineer by training. I started my career at GE Healthcare, where I was in product management, so designing and developing software. Um, great place to start a career. A bit too big, too bureaucratic for me, but I learned a lot about making software at scale. Um, I left and I went into sales, so I sold copiers and software for nice. a couple of years outside sales rep. Yeah, it's uh, okay. character building for sure. <laughs> they say copier sales reps are one one small smidgen above used car sales reps. Okay. And so, um, but it was great, right? You're out there, you just realize how important customers are, how important revenue is, how hard it is to develop those relationships. Um, so I got pretty good, pretty good at sales. And then I went to business school at Carnegie Mellon. After two years there in Pittsburgh, um, Bain & Co. here in Boston recruited me into their Boston office. And so that's what brought me to Boston about 12 years ago. At Bain, I did a third of my time in their private equity group, working on over 40 transactions. So working with kind of you know Bain Capital, TPG, big private equity firms, helping them to make acquisitions. And then with the other two-thirds of my time, I worked mostly with tech and retail companies, um, doing everything that related to the customer and related to growth. So after being in sales, I just loved growth, loved customers. So that would be for tech companies, things like B2B, Salesforce, effectiveness, customer success, um, you know, new products, new channels, pricing, same thing with retailers, in-store customer experience, products, channels, geographies, um, share wallet expansion, things like that. Um, great experience at Bain, but I wanted to go build something. So after Bain in 2016, I went to Wayfair, here, also here in Boston, and um, they asked me to come and build their North America supply chain, what they now call the Wayfair Delivery Network, which was strange, because if you've been paying attention, I had no supply chain experience yeah, yeah, yeah. up until then. And I was in an interview with uh, James and Neeraj, the COO and CEO of Wayfair, and um, they were talking about supply chain stuff. And I said, guys, you got the wrong person. I don't know anything about supply chain. And then, and then we pivoted and started talking about customers and the Wayfair customer and what they expect. And they shared some data with me that 50% of all customer feedback, positive or negative, related to the supply chain. So if you think about e-commerce, Eventually, every e-commerce company becomes a logistics company, right? The, especially on the, on the marketplace side, getting, you know, for Amazon, for example, the reason people shop at Amazon is not because they have the fanciest website, right? It's because oh, no. next day, <laughs> same day, two day shipping, it's all about that supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I get excited about the opportunity to, one, build something from scratch, and two, to re really redefine that customer experience. So in three and a half years at Wayfair, 
We opened 50 sites across North America, Jeez. 42 final mile sites, eight sort centers. It was about a $3 billion supply chain when I left. Um, and my favorite factoid from that time was when I joined Wayfair, it took on average 27 days from click to deliver for a heavy bulky item. So essentially a month, you'd click buy for a sofa and a month later it would show up. And when I left, we were doing two day delivery of couches, hot tubs, and vanities. Nice. And so it was right, just mind blowing. It's faster than brick and mortar, right? You walk into an actual furniture store, they usually can't get, get it to you in mm. two days. I did just buy a piece of furniture from Wayfair and nice. it arrived very quickly. Awesome. So I'm glad I could support you yeah. uh, in that. So <laughs> okay. how, okay, Wayfair had a great time. I mean, I see the transition, a transition into e-commerce type yep. from that. Yep. You had experience from acquisition before, exactly. right? So acquisition, Wayfair leads into e-commerce. Yep. So then from that point on, you wanted to kind of do your own thing. How, how did that then lead yeah, to yeah. Perch? So Wayfair, I'd been away for about three and a half years. Um, really proud of what we built there. And it was just starting to feel like, what's next? Um, kind of my job at Wayfair had turned from build into run. And I always, I love supply chain. I love getting deep into it, but I'm not a chief supply chain officer. That's not what I want to do with my career. So I started thinking, what's, the, what's next for me? And I found uh, this industry. I found Amazon. I found the third-party sellers. And I just started getting excited about the model. So I actually didn't set out to start a company. I was looking, I was talking to people around Boston, thinking about joining a company. And then I just found this space. And I, I a few things. One, I love the third-party sellers. I went to a conference or two down in New York. And they're just true entrepreneurs, yeah, they right? They, they have bootstrapped their companies. There's no VC money. These people really blood, sweat, and tears into these businesses and have built something profitable in the most competitive marketplace in the world. So just like really amazing people that I felt like I could work with and learn a lot from. The second was, um, as you started to allude to, it just felt like a perfect match with my background. So most recently in e-commerce and supply chain, before that, done a lot of M&A at Bain. And then earlier in my career, and this is really important, is a technology piece. So a big part of what we're building at Perch is a technology platform call an ERP for e-commerce or something like that, where we can optimize everything from forecasting our SKUs and supply chain, so we're in stock everywhere, to our listings. Um, there's a lot of data about conversion and nice. ranking on listings and, and all that kind of stuff. I, uh, I think this space is the space of acquisition, of, of uh, not acquisition, but from the seller's perspective, perspective selling their brand. Sometimes selling a brand, if you haven't done it for the first time, can be pretty daunting. Yep. And so, I mean, half of this conversation really is diving into who purchases, but it's also digging into that kind of strategy for how people, shedding some light on that for some of these sellers, right? How yep. sellers can feel a little bit more at ease even thinking about selling their brands. And you, you touched on this actually a little bit already. You mentioned when to sell, when people sell their brands, at what point in time. I, in my mind, that's one of the first strategic questions I think people ask themselves. I'm curious to hear your perspective. Uh, when, when is the best time, loaded question perhaps, when's the best time for people to sell their brand on Amazon? Yeah, um, there's I think two aspects to that. One is what makes it attractive to somebody like Perch. And the second is when's the best time to sell. Um, so on the first one, when is it attractive to perch? We, we like, like, a, as I mentioned, winning products and brands. So you have to be leading within your niche. We want top three to five in organic ranking for the relevant keywords. We want to see profitability at the SKU level. And so if you're just buying revenue, if you're spending so much on ads that you're not making any money, that's not for us yet. We want to see that you've landed and, and the Amazon customer is voting with their feet, right? They're buying you, you're holding share. You're not losing share to low price competitors or things like that. And so you're winning within your niche and you can define niches big or small, right? You don't right, have to be right, selling, right. you don't have to be like beating Energizer at batteries right. here. You know, we buy a whole bunch of things that are really successful within a, a small niche. Um, and then on the second one, win, you know, that is really a personal decision. You know what I mean? I, I, these are, um, you know, you could, if you want to do this a whole bunch of times, we've had sellers, we've actually had um, repeat sellers to us. So okay. sold a brand, took half the money, put it in savings, took the other half, started a new business, scaled it, it up. sold it again, <laughs> okay. right? So if you want to do that, yeah, it, yeah. it could be 18 months, right? You just get it to a point where it's profitable, it's working, you've proven out your, your brand and your business model. And, and some, for some people, as fast as it hits our criteria is when they want to sell. For other people, this is their life, right? And, and you might run your business for 15 years. I'm not going to tell you to sell your business if you love your business if you know you and Amazon have a good relationship and you're not dealing with any, you know, if it's kind of a low, low uh, stress activity for you, um, 
there's a whole bunch of entrepreneurs who have been running their business for a while. They work five hours a week, 10 hours a week. They have their VAs and their software providers, and this just works. And great, if you wanna let that ride out for a while, um, you should. And it's when you want some liquidity, right? If you want some cash in the bank, um, if you wanna spend your time on something else, I would say over 50% of the entrepreneurs want to invest in a new business. So this one's working, they have another idea, they need some capital, they don't wanna take a loan, they don't wanna get money from their friends or, or mm -hmm. relatives. Um, so that's a good time as well. Is there a time that, is there a business that's too young for you to yeah. buy? Yeah. So 18 months is, is really, is actually kind of the hard uh, line of like the a youngest. Minimum? Minimum, absolute okay. minimum. Typically we like to see a little bit more than that, but but we can look at the numbers um, and, and tell anybody more about that if they want to. But if you haven't been, if your business started from zero less than 18 months ago, it's probably not a fit for us yet. What really catches your eye, what really catches Purchase Eye when you're going through brands and brands are coming in the door? Yeah. What kind of catches your eye light bulb moments where you're like, hey, this is, uh, it seems to be a really good brand. Let's go further with this. Yeah. Usually within five minutes, even less, within one minute, if you send me your brand page and or just your seller uh, your seller link, I'll look on there. And if you have a bunch of ASINs that are best sellers that have, you know, 10,000, 20,000 reviews, 4.7 stars, my eyes light up. Yeah. I'm ready to talk. Um, if On the other end of that spectrum, right, if you have 10,000 SKUs, and they're all maybe throwing off $5,000 a year in revenue, right? That might add up to a big number, but that's just, none of those are winning within their niche. A big part of our thesis is that it's really hard to get to that first page, right? This applies on Google, it applies on Amazon, just in general, Amazon's a big search engine. Getting to that first page is hard and staying there organically without you know, paying tons of ads and being unprofitable is hard as well. But once you've landed there, that's something that we can take and take to the next level. So that's the, you know, product market fit in software and consumer products is the really hard part. And we wanna, we wanna catch products and brands after they've proven some of that fit. I'm super interested in the amount of information that you have in terms of strategy to actually improve an Amazon business because a big piece of Perch is taking brands in and then taking them to the next level, whatever that looks like for each brand. There are kind of two main questions that I'm, I'm going after here. Number one, how do you mix someone else's strategy with your own? Like, what does that actually look like? And number two, broadly, what are some of the biggest, I wanna dig into the biggest pieces of strategy that you've seen work well to take brands to the next level. So let's maybe start with the first one. What does that process actually look like for you to mesh your strategy with others? It's really bespoke. So it, what it is, is it really comes down to talking to the sellers. And I would say, you know, when we first got started, 80% of what the seller said, we were, we were furiously taking notes because, you know, we were on our on brand number two, brand number three, we were learning so, so much. And now I would say, you know, 95, 97% of what we hear, we're like, okay, yep, that's great that you're doing that, but something that we're already doing across our entire portfolio. But two things, one, we're humble enough to know that we don't know everything. And, and we talk about that a lot, and it's a really important part of Perch is that I remind people constantly these sellers are really successful in a really competitive ecosystem. So we always have to be open that they will teach us something new. So we're always listening and comparing what are we doing versus what they're doing. And also the second piece is Amazon and this ecosystem is changing so rapidly. So even if we had everything figured out yesterday, even if yesterday we were the perfect Amazon seller, today, you know, 10,000, I don't even know how many sellers come on Amazon every day, right? 10,000 new sellers come on and Amazon's changed their search algorithm and new advertising um, you know, offerings are out, right? There's uh, every single day there's new things happening. And so we also, we're learning a lot of those things ourselves because we're running so many brands, but we're also listening to these sellers as they come in so that we can make sure that we're capturing the best of what is a very dynamic um, ecosystem. So how do you then, how do you take, you don't have to give away secret sauce or anything like that, of yeah. course. Yeah. Um, so you can talk about whatever you want to talk about here, sure. but I'm just curious broadly what it actually looks like to take a brand to the next level. Cause you're yeah. people who are watching this sell in e-commerce or they're thinking about it or they're well yeah. into it. Right. So maybe yeah. they're thinking about selling their brands. So how can you, uh, how do you take a brand from one level to the next? Yeah, for sure. So I think there's a few layers to, to the cake, if you will. Um, at, the, at the base layer, it is about putting the best of the Perch playbook onto every brand. So usually that looks at like merchandising. So we do a full merch review, 
pricing and advertising optimization, supply chain optimization. I brought a number of my key leaders from Wayfair on the supply chain team over here. So we look about consolidating inbound container volume, about leveraging our, our same suite of QA agents, uh, about leveraging our same domestic supply chain, 3PLs and, and asset-based facilities. Um, and so I'd say, and this, this is where it's interesting. There's not one silver bullet. We find some sellers are amazing at merchandising and there's really no juice to squeeze there, but actually their supply chain has a lot of excess cost or they're out of stock a bunch. Sometimes vice versa, right? They're really good, have a really lean supply chain, but there's pricing opportunity or merchandising opportunity. So it really varies by the seller, but that's kind of phase one is how do we just make the existing business as best as we possibly can? Phase two is how do we then optimize this across um, geographies? Right, so 90% of sellers that we've acquired only sell on .com in the U.S. And so really- You said 90%? Um, 90%, wow. yeah, it's really, wow. really common, which if you think about it, not only administratively is it difficult to sell in the EU because there's VAT numbers and Brexit has made, so you now have to do both UK and, and right. EU separately, but also it's a meaningful working capital implication, right? To buy inventory for different geographies is more cash out the door that you then have to, uh, you have to front yourself. And so, so taking it to additional geographies, usually Europe and UK, and we're starting to look at other global geographies as well. And then the next one is other channels. And so we sell products through Chewy, we sell products through Walmart, we sell products through all these different channels. And so taking it to the other e-com channels, and then also talking to our brick and mortar relationships about whether or not this could play in brick and mortar. And usually, Pretty seldom can the product go straight from Amazon into brick and mortar. Usually you have to do some packaging, right? So a lot of retailers have specific packaging requirements. It's not rocket science, right? But it has to have a UPC that's registered with GS1. It has to have, like there's just a bunch of things that we have to do. And then we also have to be thoughtful about price channel conflict, right? So Amazon needs the lowest price, you lose the buy box. And so there's a, there's a lot, it's not just like a, hey, I'm gonna throw this thing over the wall to Target and see if they like it. We actually have to be thoughtful about how we approach that. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the third level there is how do we actually take this product um, and make it a really a household name? Brand, we're talking about selling Amazon brands, but uh, in the case that Amazon sellers have a good cohesive brand with yeah. a, a similar product line, like a skincare brand, let's say, yeah. versus an Amazon brand that has many different types of products that aren't cohesive. Are both of those reasonable brands to sell or do you go after the cohesive brand product line more than the rest? If you if you go back to the, the layers of the cake, so to speak, I think on the first layer within Amazon, it doesn't matter as much. You know, in general, Amazon buying behavior is what we call search, find, buy, right? If you want a spatula, you type in spatula, you find something and you buy it. And then if you want tongs, you type in tongs. You don't say, wait, what was the brand of spatula I just brought? Let me go see if I can find the matching set there. Right? And so um, within Amazon, there's, there's a couple places where that's really powerful. If you have a bunch of variants that are separate ASINs coming up on the same keywords of the same brand, that can be really powerful. So if you search, and we have a few brands like this, if you search whatever, um, you know, foundation for makeup. And, and you are, you have five placements on the first page that can be really powerful because then consumers see that and they say, wow, this is a real brand yeah. and they want to buy it. So you can get actually a conversion bump across all of, all of those. But outside of that, it kind of, you know, it, it, a product's a product and we only buy branded products because you get the brand registry and we, and then we get that same protection across other channels. Um, but having, I guess if, if the question is, would I rather have five ASINs? that are the same kind of very cohesive, but only one is a bestseller and the others are kind of laggards versus five ASINs in the same brand that are different, but they're all bestsellers. I'd rather have the five bestsellers in five different categories. Cause then we can take, we can add our product innovation on top of that. And we can say, Hey, what are the variations, size, color? How do we actually build some more first page coverage off of each of these? Mm -hmm. We're having an ASIN that just looks like it goes with that first product, but like, actually isn't on the first page, doesn't have much sales velocity, um, it doesn't help you a ton. Now, as you get up into the higher levels of that cake, so to speak, <laughs> brick and mortar, they do care about a brand that looks cohesive. And so if you have something like that, we can more kind of directly talk about how it might apply to brick and mortar. On the flip side, because we often are doing some light product innovation anyway, we can build some of that 
um, ourselves, right? So if we're selling the spatula and Target says, we also want tongs, we say, great, our manufacturer also makes tongs, right? We can, we can easily do that once we have that relationship with the retailer. So it's not do or die in terms of you That's have right. to yeah. have a cohesive brand or you have to do a bunch of separate products. It, it can work out either way. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, let's talk about the future a little bit. All right. The future of the space. Yeah. Amazon and aggregator space, like yeah. the process of uh, the space of selling your Amazon brand, I I would say is relatively new. I want to ask you because I'm not the master in this case, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like, I mean, selling an Amazon brand is not brand new, uh, but yeah. the process of building Amazon brands up to the point that they are now, like brands that have started two, three years ago or that have been successful, have grown pretty substantially. Yeah. So what does the future hold for yeah. This for the the brand aggregation space for selling Amazon sellers selling their brands for perch buying brands. What does the future look like? Yeah, um, I think this is here to stay. I think that um, you know whether you call them brand aggregators or, or we we don't love the word aggregator. Okay, I'll building. stop using yeah, that no, word. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I get it. I get why. I get why you use it um, and why other people use it. But in general, we believe that the future of retail and the future of consumer products is evidenced by Amazon, but also. You know, Wayfair has a very fragmented supplier base. You think about Flipkart in India, Coupang, Mercado Libre, Ozone in Russia. All of these global marketplaces are merging, making it really easy for entrepreneurs to launch products, which is awesome, right? So you think about 10 or 15 years ago, you probably needed a quarter million dollars to launch a product. Today, you could sell something on Amazon for maybe a thousand dollars, right? You buy 50 off of Alibaba, sell it on Amazon, and then if that works, you sell out really quickly and you can keep going. So this big fragmentation of product launches and brand launches by all these entrepreneurs because the barriers to entry are so low. But at the end of the day, the barriers to scale for consumer products are still very real. If you think about manufacturing cost advantage, supply chain cost advantage, access to capital, access to other channels where they don't have the technological capability to have a lot of suppliers, so brick and mortar, a lot of these other channels, they just can't deal with millions of suppliers. They need to have a few relationships. Um, and so you th so what's happening is consumers are, are buying online. They're paying more attention to reviews and social over Super Bowl ads. And so share is going to all these micro brands, but big CPG can't really manage. You know, they, if you think about Procter & Gamble, they buy companies all the time. They spend 20 to $40 billion a year, not just, but not just Procter & Gamble, but CPG broadly, 20 to $40 billion a year on M&A. But they buy 500 million to a billion dollar brands because that's kind of what they can consume. They can't buy 105 million dollar brands. And so that's where kind of back to the earlier career in technology, building a technology base where we can run 100 and 1,000 and 10,000 $5 million brands. And some of them will become $100 million brands and $500 million brands, but some of them won't, right? Some of them will just be great products and they'll continue to sell and we'll push them global. But they, you know, not every single product will become a household name. And so consumers are moving this way. There's more and more um, people who are starting these brands. And as we continue to buy them, one, I think more people will start them. So some part of the reason why I think the upstream of our space, launching new products on Amazon, has largely been this kind of you know, entrepreneurs scrapping things together is because there's been no exit for them. So now that they know somebody will buy your company, I bet a bunch more people coming out of wherever, great schools or, or kind of random places will say, I'm gonna start a brand because maybe one day Perch will buy it from me, right? So you can have this great cycle of innovation. Some of them will fail, but the successful ones, we can buy them and then they'll keep doing it again. And as we can take our products global, I think we can continue to take share from big CPG. And so the challenge is it's really complex, right? And that's where, so the future of the aggregator space, I don't know how many winners there'll be, you know, there'll be there'll probably be a few. Like there's, you know, there's Procter & Gamble, Unilever, J and J, Mondelez. There's a whole bunch of CPG companies. There can be a whole bunch of micro CPG companies as well, like micro brand CPG companies. But it's really easy to buy three of these or five of these. I remember when we had five, me and my three employees were sitting around and we were like, this is awesome, right? Like, you know, we got a few brands. We just check on them every morning. We, you know, make sure we're not going out of stock. And then we got to like 20 and we we're like, oh my God, this is pretty hard. And then we got to 40 and we're all pulling out our hair <laughs> and we're like, you know, we're running all these seller central accounts and we're trying yeah, to keep wow. our hand around all these things. Wow. And so if we hadn't built this technology platform and we didn't have the capability to run and grow these brands at scale, 
you start to kind of trip on your own shoelaces a little bit, yeah, yeah. right? And you need, because as, as you know, and all these sellers know, maybe nine out of 10 days, everything goes perfectly, right? Especially if you already have a bestseller and things are going well, but one out of 10 days, something rough. happens, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Real like, rough. You know, your, your supplier misses the deadline or you get delisted or something, you know, all sorts of random things happen. Right. And when you have a whole bunch of brands, any given day, a bunch of those things are happening at once. And so being able to monitor and react quickly is, um, it's big, it's, so, it's a lot of investment. Let's talk about technology. Yeah. So take a, utilize this technology, right? We're yeah, betting exactly. on tech being a huge part of the future of e-commerce, not just Amazon e-com and retail in general. So yeah. I love talking tech and I love the fact that you're building technology to handle all these brands because otherwise you have to hire of a lot of people and handle the human element of interacting in all these ways. And yes, you can do that. I would imagine it's really hard to scale something like that and handle everything all at one time. So how will technology impact the future of e-commerce? Oh man, I don't know how to, I don't know how to so separate first those define things, technology. Right? First exactly. define technology, first define technology. No, no, well, it's like, they're it so it intertwined. It doesn't have to right? be the right it's answer, like, yeah. right? It doesn't have to be yeah. the right answer, but yeah. your best guess as to how yeah. an impact will come. Yeah how technology will change the way that people do things yeah. in the e-commerce space. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I guess to start, e-commerce is technology, is. right? Like at its very core, it is using technology to connect buyers and sellers. I think as these marketplaces and ecosystems continue to grow and people continue to move online, um, the ability to use technology is the only way that people will be able to scale, right? The only way that you can go from having a $2 million brand to having a $20 million brand like you said, you could just hire a whole bunch of people, but the better way to do it is through technology. And as you think about, um, you know, right now, e-commerce is what, like 25%? It spiked th during yeah, coronavirus, so it's like 25%. Yeah, yeah as, that, as that continues to grow and it's 50%, 60%, 70% of global retail, right? The, the, and given what I said about how scale matters in consumer products, yes. it doesn't matter to start, but it matters to scale. Like to get to, to global distribution and to have a, um, a household brand name, you need to have some scale so that you can compete on cost and you can compete as you go to retailers to you know, work for shelf space. Um, and so technology is really, it's like the only way to do these things yeah. and the only way to be competitive. And, and that's what I love about this space. You know, Amazon is so hyper competitive that the only way for us, for example, on pricing, the only way for us to have a best in class pricing al algorithm is through technology because we have to not only know what our own price is, but know what all of our competitors' price is, watch how share is changing over time and react in real time because yeah. we know that there's people out there watching their listing every single hour of every single yeah. day. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And unless we want to pay a whole bunch of people to do that. <laughs> which you could. Which you could. It'd just be very expensive very quickly. <laughs> we need to find a way to keep up and, and to beat those people. Um, and, so, and, and like I said, 10,000 more of those people are coming every single day. Right, right. And so it's, it's going to continue to be hyper competitive. But on the plus side, there's so much data in e-commerce. We can very clearly see how people are buying, you know, what the BSR is, which is a really good way to impute um, what, what your share is, um, you know, what's happening with advertising and, and mm -hmm. organic ranking. And so there's so much data that if you can consume in the right way and use in the right way, it's really, it's really cool what you can do with all that. Well, you're gonna be a prosper. Yes. Right? Yeah. So for everyone watching right now, whenever you're watching, hopefully before prosper, um, come meet us at Prosper. Yes. Perch, Chris, uh, talk about selling your brand, talk about selling your business and ask any questions, grill them like I did questions, today. Yeah. <laughs> and Chris, thank you so much for being here, for being on the show, yeah. really appreciate it. Thanks and for looking forward to see how Perch grows. Thanks, thanks for having me. Good to see you.